Okay, so today we're going to be talking about Downton Abbey and how it handles queer history. Now, this is a topic that has been suppurating and festering away in the deepest, darkest recesses of my mind for years at this point. So let me accompany you into the gloom that I inhabit. You may be wondering why this topic bothers me so much. It seems pretty silly. But Downton Abbey began airing just as I realized that I was very much not straight, and it was the first time I ever saw a pre-1969 queer character represented in the media. Given that I've basically been a history nerd since birth, this type of representation was fascinating and important to me. In this video, I'm going to be discussing what I liked about the show's representation, what I disliked, and why it's ignorant to blame bad writing decisions on historical accuracy. Downton Abbey is a show about an aristocratic family and its servants from 1912 to 1925-ish. You've got the rich people in the upstairs of the house and the poor people in the downstairs, but then the poor people also live in the attics. So it's more like the rich people live in the center and the poor people live below and to the sides. And then a bunch of people die from the Titanic, World War I, the Spanish flu, childbirth, car crashes. The character of interest to us for the sake of this video is Thomas Barrow. He started out the series as a footman. In the first episode, he bullies the new valet and makes out with the duke. So, if there's two things we know about him from the very start, it's that he is gay and is a villain. And that's where a lot of viewers' assessments of the character tended to end. However, I would argue that there's far more to the character. In season one, we learn that Thomas is ambitious. He wants to become a valet, but beyond that, he wants to leave service and make a life for himself. He is resentful of the position that he's been assigned in the world and critical of the class system. After a season of scheming, Thomas enlists in the RAMC right as World War I breaks out. Season 2 sees him, two years later, working at the front lines of the Somme. In the stress of battle, he injures himself and is sent home, where he proved capable of administering a convalescent home. After the war, he tries to start his own business on the black market, but fails horribly and ends up working at Downton again. What I like about Thomas is that he is an active character who does not submit to the pressures of the society he exists in. Shelley L. Craig et al. wrote in 2014 that media depictions of LGBTQ young people are frequently characterized by instability, vulnerability, and victimization rather than resilience or self-efficacy. And I would personally say that this characterization is applicable to a lot of mainstream representations of LGBTQ people in the 2000s to early 2010s, especially if the media has a historical setting. However, despite being set in a time when homosexuality was criminalized and narratives related to it often centered around suicide and tragedy, Thomas owns who he is and is not ashamed. I'm not foul. Mr. Carson, I'm not the same as you, but I'm not foul. Despite his many failures and setbacks throughout the series, he picks himself up to keep on going and never accepts the lot that he's been dealt. Thomas is the way he is because he views his existence as a struggle against the obscure forces of a society that hates him. He feels that, as a gay, working-class man, the world is against him, and so he doesn't owe it anything. And honestly, in a show where basically every downstairs character is a sycophantic monarchy worshipper, his willingness to insult the upstairs folks is a breath of fresh air. I actually think that Thomas is often pigeonholed as the irredeemable villain of the show because Downton Abbey is, at its core, the nostalgic wet dream of a rich old monarchist. Of the servants, Thomas is one of the sole voices of bitterness and dissatisfaction with the highly stratified class system. He, as a character, is critical of the status quo that the show nostalgically glorifies. Thomas is far from a good person, but I think that he does make for an interesting and sympathetic character. At the start of the series, Thomas is a character of vitality and motivation, a mess of ambition and paranoia, who schemes and plots, but also has moments of incredible vulnerability. Don't let Mark all over you. you gotta fight your con. What with? Your brain. You're not a victim, don't let them make you into one. But then the character does a complete 180. Revolutionary anger and ambition is replaced with resignation and depression. In the later seasons of the show, Thomas's storylines revolve around his failures at romantic relationships, efforts to cure himself of his homosexuality using electroshock therapy, and, of course, the cherry on top of any tragic queer historical narrative, 
suicide, though in this case only attempted. Now, you could say that this is the tragic result of living under the constant pressure of a homophobic system. However, I think it's just the writers advancing Downton Abbey's apparent message that you have to accept your place in the world and shouldn't do anything to change it, an extension of the show's nostalgia for rigid class hierarchies. In fact, in Downton Abbey, a celebration, Jessica Fellows literally writes that, quote, in the final series, Thomas realizes that despite his many years of service at Downton Abbey, his co-workers and employers are unable or unwilling to reward him with basic trust and character. His redemption, if one may call it that, is in his friendships with the children and his realization that Downton Abbey is as good as it can get for him. So, the redemption for a character who has always been critical of the show's inequitable and stratified class system is to accept his place in the world and accept the fact that he should spend the best years of his life slaving away for a family that really couldn't care less about him and only occupies a higher place in society because of generations of hoarding wealth. And also, given that Thomas tries to kill himself in the last season, this redemption is tied with him accepting the circumstances that drove him to suicide. His redemption is to realize that the feelings of isolation and helplessness that Downton Abbey generates for him are as good as it gets. I've often wondered if this place is haunted. It ought to be. Are the spirits of maids and footmen who died in slavery? Now, as you may be able to tell, I have a rather specific loathing for Downton based on its messaging about class politics. However, in terms of Thomas's story arc, most of the criticisms that I've encountered center around how it reinforces the kill your gaze trope and denies the character the romantic relationship that literally, and I mean literally, everyone else in the show develops. Now, a little disclaimer. I realize how important it can be to portray happy endings for queer characters in the media, but I do not believe that works are required to do this, and I, personally, am a slut for angst. However, what I do take issue with is the fact that people involved in the show asserted that Thomas couldn't end up in a happy relationship because of its historical context. When Jessica Fellows was asked about the resolution to Thomas's arc on the show, she said that it would be, quote, unrealistic to show Thomas in a loving gay relationship, as that was not a reality then. When questioned about what statistics there were to support her point, Fellows replied that, quote, it was illegal. And this is just some incredibly faulty logic. It's like asserting that no one consumed alcohol during prohibition because it was illegal. I intend to complicate the notion that gay relationships were unrealistic during the 1920s just because they were illegal. I don't want to critique fellows or anyone else involved in the show, I merely want to create a more complex image of the history that they essentialize. Okay, so let's dive into the nitty gritty of this historical analysis. By the late 19th century, London had developed a commercial gay subculture. This included bars, brothels, bathhouses, and the like. These institutions were often public, visible, and concentrated in small areas, making it easier for authorities to police them. However, Downton Abbey is located in the north of England in Yorkshire. While the abbey itself is fictional, it is located near the town of Ripon and the characters travel to Ripon and York with relative frequency. So, what we should really be looking at is this book, Masculinity, Class, and Same-Sex Desire in Industrial England, 1895-1957, by Helen Smith. It's an excellent book. Would recommend it. <laughs> Smith argues that sex among working-class men in the North was generally private and did not occur in a commercial context. A gay subculture and identity similar to the one that developed in London at the turn of the century didn't develop in the North until the 1950s through 70s. Why exactly was this? We can see that in larger cities like London, the emergence of queer subcultures came hand in hand with policing of queer people. Subcultures could help support people who were generally not accepted and were policed. In Berlin, for example, possibly the European city with the largest queer subculture during the early 20th century, the police even developed a specialized department of homosexuals. But how was the North different from this? Prosecutions for homosexual acts were very rare. 
In 1900, prosecutions were in the single digits out of a population of 10.5 million. From at least 1895 through the 1950s, the number of prosecutions in London was, on average, triple the number in the North. During the interwar period, London's population ranged from 7 to 8.5 million, while the population of the North was between 12 and 13 million. So, despite the fact that the North had almost doubled the population of London, it had about a quarter the number of prosecutions as London did. Smith describes how the North had a strong working-class culture in which policing moral offenses and regulating the private life through the monitoring of drinking and sex were seen as an official agency attempting to impose the values of the middle-class elite on working people. Working-class people generally resisted attempts by the state to impose its authority on their private lives, and prosecutions that did take place often involved a perceived abuse of power. Furthermore, the police force was largely undermanned and underfunded. They didn't have the resources to carry out raids or entrapment for more low-key offenses such as gross indecency, or to consider homosexual acts a discrete category of offense, as London did. People who are prosecuted for homosexual acts are generally caught in searches of public spaces that also targeted heterosexual indecency and prostitution. So, the scene in the movie where Thomas goes to a gay bar in New York that is raided by the police and where he is subsequently arrested is completely inaccurate and unfeasible for the reasons that A. In 1925 and 1929, there were fewer than 20 prosecutions in the entire northeastern Assize, which is where York is, and in the bar alone, there were at least twice as many people than that. And B, there were actually no such things as gay venues in the North at the time. Why was this? Because men did gay things at regular bars. As Smith says, the absence of bar raids in the records points to this disengagement from specific urban subcultures. This lack of space specifically for men who desired men has been seen as evidence of repression and backwardness. However, it could also be evidence of the long and enduring tradition of working-class pubs being areas working men could meet for a pint to negotiate sex, or both. Men and women operated in different spheres and usually socialized entirely within these spheres, meaning that it was common to be more intimate and open with people of the same gender. Male affection, both physical and emotional, was a part of everyday life. Sexologist Havelock Ellis observed that, among English working classes, quote, friends often kissed each other, though this habit seems to vary a good deal in different sections and colonies. Men commonly sleep together, whether comrades or not, and so easily get familiar. If you're like me, you're probably wondering, with these strict spheres of gendered socialization, were women intimate in the same ways that men were? What about the sapphic ladies? The thing is, female sexuality that did not result in childbirth is hard to find historical statistics on. Many studies of gay men in the 19th and 20th centuries rely on crime statistics, but female homosexual relations were never criminalized in the same way. However, in an expansive study of women's diaries and correspondence, Carol Smith Rosenberg found that the strict gender divides and homosocial spheres of 19th century America allowed women to develop incredibly intimate relationships with one another, a decent number of which were also romantic and physically intimate. It doesn't seem like too much of a stretch to think that the situation could have been similar in England. Okay, so let's get back to the argument of historical realism that was brought up in relation to Downton Abbey. Smith paints a picture of the industrial north in which there was minimal policing of homosexual acts and in which it was considered acceptable for working class men to be physically intimate. However, the character of Thomas, though he is a working class man in northern England, doesn't fall entirely within this picture. Oral histories reveal that casual sex between men was commonplace. However, working class men had, quote, either no access to or no desire to engage with the language that could categorize, pathologize, or politicize it. Thomas, on the other hand, views himself as different because of his sexuality. He views his sexual orientation as an element of his identity. 
This is probably because, as a servant who occupies an in-between space of sorts, he has likely been exposed to more cosmopolitan, middle- and upper-class sexological understandings of sexuality that codified homosexuality as an identity. These types of understandings largely emerged in the latter half of the 19th century. Another issue that you could bring up is that the research I have discussed is mostly focused on industrial workers rather than domestic service workers. However, while the Abbey may have had conceptions of masculinity and sexuality that differed from northern regional and class-based ones, Thomas still lives in an area where it is normal for men to display physical affection for one another, and where sex between men was commonplace and rarely punished. So, yeah, I think the argument that it would be unrealistic to show Thomas in a loving gay relationship as that was not the reality then is utter nonsense. Just look at the prominent example of Edward Carpenter, a socialist writer who lived in Sheffield from the 1870s to 1920s. He and his partner George Merrill lived together relatively openly for nearly three decades and no one questioned them. In fact, they were considered pillars of the community. And people just know about Carpenter because he was famous for his writings. For every queer figure who is remembered by history, there are probably hundreds who lived their lives in relative peace and obscurity. Anyways, the takeaway from this should be that history is nowhere near as simple as we think it is. Neither is history always a tale of progress. It's full of false starts and steps backwards. It just so happens that Northern England was more open towards non-normative sexualities in the 1910s than it was in the 1960s. Sometimes history is just weird like that. The past is a wild and strange place. The other takeaway from this is please, please don't use historical realism as an excuse for your regressive and shitty storytelling. Hmm. Is that it? Are we done? Are we done? I feel better.